Welcome back to our Waiting for God Advent retreat for faculty and staff. Part three right here, we're focusing on the figure of St. Simeon, who might not be as familiar to you as the figures that we focused upon in the first two weeks might be. Now, you remember that part one featured Bob Funder, our Associate Vice President for Mission and Ministry, and Bob focused on the Advent figure, St. John the Baptist, and he used this image here, and hopefully you've got those holy cards, you're collecting them now. This is the Virgin and Child with St. Anne and St. John the Baptist by Leonardo da Vinci. Then as the presentation went on, he also used this icon. But he could have used this one, or he could have used this one, which for me is a particular favorite because it's St. John the Baptist holding in his hand the head of St. John the Baptist. Kind of a freaky little icon, but there are countless images that Bob could have chosen. So that was two weeks ago. Last week, in part two, we had the person of the Blessed Virgin Mary, presented by Dr. R. Lee Hagstrom, professor of theology and the inaugural holder of the Christie Chair in Catholic and Dominican Studies. And R. Lee, for her part, used this image. This is the Annunciation by our Dominican brother, the artist Blessed Fra Angelico. And then she used details from some other Fra Angelico pieces. There's the lamentation over Christ. Then there's this detail from scenes from the life of Christ. Now, Aurelie had even more images at her disposal than Bob did with John the Baptist. She could use this one, the Black Madonna, Our Lady of Czestochowa from Poland. Or this one, this is Our Lady of Knock from County Mayo in Ireland. Or she could have used Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico. Or since Aurelie showed herself to be biased towards all the Dominican artists, she might have chosen the famous statue of Our Lady in Fatima the handiwork of our Dominican brother, Father Thomas McGlynn. Footnote here for those of you who are art fans, uh, the statuary of Father McGlynn is found all over campus, principally uh, by Dominic House, the image of St. Dominic, or Martin Hall, the image of St. Martin de Porres. Father McGlynn being uh, not just a Dominican, but a faculty member here in the art department at Providence College. Anyhow, just Google the phrase Marian icons. And you will find over 7.7 .7 million results that Dr. Hagstrom could have used for last week's, last week's presentation. Okay, so that brings us all the way to part three here today. And as I mentioned, I will be focusing on the figure of St. Simeon. And you might be asking yourself after two action-packed weeks with John the Baptist and Our Lady, and I wouldn't blame you if you were. You'd be asking yourself, who in the name of all that is holy is St. Simeon, and you're not alone. I myself, no stranger to things theological, no foreigner in the lands of Christian art and architecture went online to find an image to use and Googled Simeon. And this is what I came up with. <laughs> this, of course, is Simeon Rottier former offensive lineman from the Edmonton Eskimos of the Canadian Football League. Now this Simeon retired earlier this year, and if you wonder what he's doing now, I'm pretty sure that he became the Associate Vice President for Mission and Ministry <laughs> at Providence College. With that wild flow and scraggly beard. This is why, by the way, this wasn't going to work via podcast. It's really image dependent. Then I came across this image, and it seems to be much more appropriate than the one of Mr. Rottier or even Mr. Funder. This is Rembrandt's image of St. Simeon. So who is he? We turn to the Gospel of St. Luke. The evangelist writes, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And inspired by the Spirit, he came into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Master, you may let your servant go in peace 
according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all the peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and glory for your people Israel. Now before going back and looking at the Rembrandt on your holy cards, look at this image right here, because this one, interestingly enough, is also by Rembrandt. He painted this scene in 1631 at just 25 years of age. You can see that just as the scripture verse just said, Joseph and Mary were in the temple to dedicate their newborn baby Jesus to God and to make the customary offerings there. At that moment, the child is recognized by Simeon as the long-awaited Messiah, the one whom he was promised to see and hold in his own arms before he would ever see death. He is the long-awaited Messiah, and so the old man takes him in his arms and bursts into a song of praise, the song that we heard St. Luke describe right there. Master, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. The promise has come true, for my own eyes have seen the salvation which you brought upon your people Israel. He is a light for revelation and glory for your people, your chosen ones. Simeon sings that song of praise. And you can see here, through the artist's use of light, the light that, that illumines the face of Simeon, whose eyes are wide, whose jaw is slack, the light seems to be coming right from the child Jesus himself. The light of the world come into Simeon's own arms, giving light where formerly there was darkness and shadow. Again, that was how Rembrandt saw this mystery that scripture lays out in this figure of St. Simeon, whom we're looking at today. It's how he saw him as a young man. Now, back to the image on your cards. Rembrandt painted this one in 1669. And interestingly, this may have been the last painting that Rembrandt ever did. It was actually found in his workshop unfinished several days after he died. And in this one, by way of contrast, Simeon is really an old man standing at death's door. In this painting, rather than looking at all of the, the background things, all of the other people, uh, the, the, the scene and all of the colors, in this one, the focus is entirely on the reaction of St. Simeon. Gone are all the other figures. Gone are the details depicting the temple in splendor. It's just Simeon holding the Messiah in his arms. And you can see on your cards, there's a reaction of peace, a reaction of calm, a reaction of fulfillment. Interesting that Rembrandt would revisit this scene at the end of his life and see it in a new way, isn't it? In our brief time together over the past several weeks, we have had a chance to look at some of the models of Advent in John the Baptist and Our Lady. But the title of our retreat here is Waiting for God. And I would suggest to you that this is something that St. Simeon represents in a singular and wonderful way. Because back to the scripture, remember we're told that St. Simeon hears, inspired by God, that he should not see death before he had seen the Messiah. And so what does he do? He waits. And he waits. And he waits. Day after day, making those same visits to the temple. And you have to think, put yourself in Simeon's place here, you have to think that every day he came through those temple doors, he'd be asking himself, is today the day? Is today the day that the promise will be fulfilled? Is today the day that God will make good on his promise? And every day as he leaves the temple, in disappointment, he has to think, 
When will it actually occur? When will the promise be fulfilled? St. Simeon, in the gospel account in St. Luke that describes him, is really a figure in a story of fidelity. It's a story about believing when there aren't all that many reasons to believe. The evidence isn't there before his eyes for him to see, for him to lay hold of. Rather, he's holding on to a promise. We've all had those experiences, I think, if if we're honest. Whether you're you're new to the faith game or you've been practicing it your whole life, whether you're somebody who has professed to God by vow or by virtue of ordination, or somebody who's just trying to live out their baptismal calling. There's not one of us who hasn't had the experience of looking around and not seeing all that many reasons to believe. Proof seems to be in short supply. And the questions that can crop up are many. Questions that can actually haunt us all the way to the core, saying to yourself, is any of this stuff actually real? Is the practice of my faith, whether communally or something I do on my own, something that's grounded in reality, is there anyone out there listening who might hear my prayer, or is this some sort of fairy tale? Some kind of story that's been made up and handed on throughout the generations to help us to sleep at night when faced with the prospect of the night that does not end. Is any of this stuff for real? That's why Simeon is such an important figure for our lives. Because St. Simeon goes back to the temple day after day. He's the model of perseverance and patience. He hangs in there. And why? Again, it's not because any of that proof was actually there. He wasn't seeing signs of the times. You have to think that's the daily practice of St. Simeon in the temple, to go through the same thing over and over again, disappointed in the lack of results. So why does he go back? And what is there for us to learn from this encounter? Well, Scripture doesn't say. We can nevertheless be certain That Simeon was faithful because he believed that the one who had made that promise was worthy of trust. That even though senses failed to reveal the coming of the Messiah, God himself was worthy of all trust. The Holy Spirit had come upon him in similar fashion to the way in which it came upon Our Lady. He believed that the one who made the promise is worthy of all trust. Beyond being the model of fidelity, he also, St. Simeon, points us towards the importance of perseverance. That is, persisting in some good practice, and we can say that drawing near to God in the temple, that is going to church, is something good. He's the model of perseverance that's persisting in that something good until the end result is accomplished or until the promise is fulfilled. St. Simeon is the the model of the virtue of patience, which, of course, is very similar to to perseverance, can be uh, shown to be distinct by, uh, by representing the process of kind of hanging in there when things are difficult hanging in there in the face of sorrow. It's interesting to note, for those of you who are friends of St. Thomas Aquinas, by the way, that both of these virtues, patience and perseverance, are treated under the umbrella of fortitude. Fortitude. Patience is often taken as something meek and passive, not so with St. Thomas Aquinas. Strength and courage in the face of those things that might be difficult, resisting those difficulties. And so we have this figure uh, held out to us on this Advent day for our uh, our edification, 
and for our imitation. Recognizing that if for us in, in our own lives, the evidence that we seek, that we, we, we beg God for when we say, show me some sign, show me you're there. Even when those things are lacking, the one who calls us to himself, the one who has made us for himself, the one who has conformed us and made us in his image and likeness is the one who has promised us that he will never leave us to face our troubles alone. He is the one who said that the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. And even though signs may be present to the contrary, and whatever storms may come up or whatever winds may blow, no matter how many signs to the contrary might be there, the Lord is there and worthy of all trust. You can see it in the figure of St. Simeon, rewarded in the temple when at long last, when his, his face had grown long and his vision had grown weak, and all of the other things, the splendor of youth and that earlier understanding of Rembrandt had been stripped away, leaving only the basics. God was, in fact, faithful and delivered on his promise, even in what must have seen the most unlikely of ways. And so it will be for all of us in our own lives in our own vocations, in our own place here on campus, and with our families and friends. The one who has made the promises to us is worthy of all our trust. So, uh, a couple of reflection prompts for our conversation here together. The first, the list of discouraging things about the church is long. I'm actually part of seven or eight reasons on that list of discouragement. The list of discouraging things about the church is long. What are some reasons for hope? That is, what are some of the things that we can see and say, you know what, for all of the other things going on, we can be happy about this. We can be confident in this. We can thank God for this. We can place our hope in this or these. And the second and this is a personal one, and if you're not ready to, to share this with others or share this with the entire room, uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's still worth uh, bringing to prayer and asking for yourself. When so many people have parted ways with the church, why do you stay? What are the promises that you long to, to, to receive? And why hang in there when so many others have parted? So, uh, as we've done in weeks, uh, weeks past, if you want to kind of uh, break up into smaller groups with folks around you, uh, you can reflect upon these questions. We'll get back together in about 10 minutes.